Okay. Ah. Oh. Oops. Just say got it. Great. Okay, well, it's a real pleasure for me to um, introduce Thomas Guthams. Um, Thomas is a postdoctoral scholar at Stanford where he's working with a number of people, including Brian Wandell, Peter Catrice, and myself and many others. Um, <clears throat> I first met Thomas in 2019 when uh, Peter Catrice invited him to give a sign talk. Some of you might remember the talk he gave then where he described his work on thin filters uh, for the snapshot multispectral imagers that are being made at IMEC. Uh, IMEC is in Belgium and close to KU Leuven, where uh, Thomas received his undergraduate master's and doctoral degrees in engineering. And when Thomas completed his doctoral research at uh, IMEC, which he did at IMEC, Brian and I recruited him to do a postdoc at Stanford. And since this was during COVID, uh, the first six months of his postdoc took remote took place remotely over Zoom, but the last eight months, we've really enjoyed having him here at Stanford in person. And uh, alas, he will be leaving us soon, uh, returning to the Netherlands where he's gonna start a research job at ASML. Uh, but he's made a lot of friends here at Stanford and in the Bay Area, so I'm sure you're gonna come back for a visit. And uh, we've gotten pretty good at uh, meetings over Zoom. So uh, this is not the end of our friendship or collaboration and um, not the last sign talk that I'm sure you're gonna give. But today, Thomas is gonna talk about camera simulation in a world of trade secrets. And he's gonna to describe to us what that means. So thanks, Thank Thomas. You. Thank you very much, Joyce, for the introduction. It was been, has been a pleasure to be here with you as well. So today I wanted to talk about camera simulation in a world of trade secrets. And in preparation yesterday evening, I, I was playing around with these kind of uh, text to image generators that are now popping up everywhere. And I ask it to generate like a photographer calibrating a camera outside in the rain. And this is what it produced. It, it seems pretty good. And it's, it looks a bit like sad that this person has to be outside in the rain to calibrate this camera. And so part of this work will be about helping this person doing this in simulation. So he doesn't have to go out anymore. Um, I also, by the way, just noticed he has three legs. Okay. <laughs> um, so, but... Uh, yeah, but imaging systems, I think I, I'm preaching to the choir almost here, are nowadays in almost all consumer devices. We have them in our smartphones, in our laptops, in our cars, and in our handheld devices, and soon in my glasses, and perhaps our fridge as well. And not only are the cameras becoming more pervasive everywhere, they're also becoming more sophisticated, more complex. And for example, for our smartphone, we have more and more cameras being integrated in one device and the lens is becoming more sophisticated but also on the pixel itself the image sensor itself there are lots of new innovations and the architecture is also becoming way more complex where we have micro lenses and multiple pixels below a, a micro lens and I'll, I'll talk more about that why people do that and why we want to simulate this kind of uh, device now because imaging systems are becoming more much more complex well, as a designer, you, you will ask yourself, like, well, what will the final image look like? Will the, the thing do what I, what I want it to do? And the way one, way, way one way you can do that is by building the physical system. You build your camera, you build a test scene. This is a test scene, and this is choice. And we take an actual picture, and then we look at the measurement, and then we do whatever we want with it, whether it's some algorithms that you want to unleash on it or not. But... This is quite time intensive and it would be save everyone a lot of time if you can do this whole process in simulation where you really model the camera and, and all, all of its components. And in our community of optics and computer vision, we have already a big, large set of tools, including ZMAX and Code 5 to model the lenses. But there are also other tools to really model the photonic structures on your image sensor and the circuitry, the electric circuitry in the image sensor. But if you want to predict what the final image will look like, you need to somehow bring all these components together. And we've, in, well, Brian and Joyce and in the lab, we, we've worked on that for quite some time now. And also there's, there's some recent industrial interest, interest to really combine these tools into one pipeline. And I'll, I'll tell you a bit what such a pipeline might look like if you want to do something called physics-based image sim system simulation. And well, the, the first step is actually to be able to define a scene. 
is seen. It has some illuminance that radiates onto the objects. The objects have some reflectance and light reflects specularly, diffusely, in all sorts of ways. And at some point, that light reaches an optical system, like a lens, which focuses the light onto your image sensor. So you need to model that. And this, this model will include anything you want, right? You, the diffraction, geometrical distortion, lens flare, and anything that you, you really want to include. And once you have that optical image, you want to make the step towards a sensor image where you have some digital number that comes out of your digital device. And to make the connection between the optical world and the electronic world of the sensor, it is extremely useful that we have a physics-based simulator where we actually have physical units at each step of the way. And for example, in the scene, you, you want a spectral radiance where you have from each point in the scene, a certain number of photons per time, well, per time, per star radian angle, per wavelength, per square meter, that radiates towards the lens, which focuses the light and produces an irradiance arriving photons. And then once you have the photons, you can just take your data sheet from the image sensor and look at all the, all the, all the properties, some geometric properties, some electronic properties, some noise uh, characteristics and combine the two worlds because in the end this the photodiode in the image sensor will convert a number of photons to a number of electrons and that's what we call the quantum efficiency for example and it's really the units that make this whole pipeline uh, work well so you know okay the sensor part has been already modeled for quite some time using a tool that was developed here at Stanford called ISETCAM and it integrates all these kind of details of the sensor. And it has also the possibility to model the scene and the optics part, but only for 2D scenes. And so recently our lab switched towards the usage of PBRT, which will enable us to use the full glory of computer graphics and have 3D, 3D scenes. And this is kind of what, what it can do. So PBRT stands for physic, physics based ray tracing. And what the ray tracing really offers us is that we can produce really photographically realistic pictures, which are beautiful, but they are also physically meaningful. As in, for each point in the scene, we'll have spectral radiance and units. And that's how we can continue to connect that with our sensor model. And so once we have access to this whole world of PBRT and combine it with ISETCAM, that's when you can start to do prototyping before you build an actual physical camera. You can just make a scene, make, a sim make an optical simulator, and then use ISETCAM. But a more recent uh, application that is getting uh, lots of attention is something called synthetic data generation, specifically for machine learning. Because um, when, well, if you've done machine learning, you often need a large data set of trained, well, of labeled data to train your model and every time in imaging at least if you change your image sensors or let's let's try different color filters or let's try a different lens in principle you think well I, I will have to recapture my data and go outside again in the rain and take a picture um, but since we have access to now really photorealistic uh, data this is for example a simulated car scene then we can just generate these kind of scenes and we exactly know uh, for, sorry, yeah, for each object, what it is. So, because we, we made the scene ourselves, and so we, we automatically have segmentation and labeling of the data. And you can imagine using this for training your algorithms in the future. Eh? We just, you change the lens in the simulator, you change the sensor in the simulator, and you just generate labeled data. That's the, that's the vision there. And, well, I showed you a car scene from 2018, but my colleague, uh, Zhen Yi Liu, has become way better in the meantime to produce pretty car scenes that are realistic. And I, I'm using them now to make a second point about synthetic data generation, which is that not only it's not only useful to produce label data, but just to simulate scenarios that almost never occur. For example, if you have uh, you work in autonomous driving, well, you, you might not want to wait for a deer to appear on, on, on your road to really know whether your algorithms work. If you can just simulate it, and I've seen, I think, for example, Tesla, they, 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 I've seen simulators like that, and um, then you can test in simulation whether the algorithm works. 
So then the natural question is like, okay, we have all these tools now. Can we validate them, experimentally validate them? And that's what we've been trying to do for the past few years. And specifically, we wanted to validate it for a smartphone camera. Um, in this case, the Pixel 4a. And why, why, why did we want to simulate a smartphone camera? Because it has some interesting properties. Of course, if you want to simulate, you have to start with the scene. So we have some scene, which we can model in PBRT. And we'll have some optics, ray tracing, that also happens in PBRT. But the interesting thing about the smartphone is that nowadays, we all have, uh, there's some interesting pixel optics on the image sensor. And so the image sensor consists of micro lenses. And below each micro lens, we have multiple pixels. And I'll get back to why that is the case and how that's useful. But we need to simulate this part as well if we want to fully unleash the application. And once we have that figured out, we can just connect the rest to ISETCAM to include the, uh, the, the sensor model and all the, the whole data sheet. But when you try to do this, you quickly run into the practical issue is that, well, okay, we want to simulate the smartphone camera. And I, I can ask Google, like, please give me the lens design, but they, they, can, they, they can't tell me, it's proprietary. Um, so I have to deal with an unknown lens design, that's a problem. Second is if I go then to the image sensor, there's some pixel optics. I don't know the, the size, the, well, the size maybe yes, but no, I don't know the radius of the micro lens and the material and how they are aligned above the pixel because that changes depending on where you are on the image sensor. So that's, that's, that's a practical issue. And so it seems like we're stuck, but then, well, wait, wait a minute. We have here ISETCAM where we model a sensor. And for all these years, everyone who has used ISETCAM to simulate a sensor never really had to know anything about the circuitry of the device and they were also never shared with them. We, we had another way to deal with this kind of problem of proprietary information. We use, well, we use the data sheet, all these numbers about the pixel size and how much light uh, enters the pixel and whatnot. And this is something we call phenomenological models. It, these are models that just describe the behavior of the system without actually knowing the internals and how it's designed. Just or oh, just a, a linear gain with a certain slope and a certain amount of crosstalk and a certain distribution, statistical distribution of noise. And that's how you model it without knowing why per se. And so this kind of rhythm, we would like to repeat for the other parts. So by that, I mean, we need more phenomenological models so we can access this whole world of PBRT to do the optics part and connect that with ISETCAM and do the whole image system simulation. And second, what will make this happen is the fact that using these phenomenological models, just as for the image sensor, we can respect proprietary information. So people might be willing to share this kind of data rather than hide it so that we can all benefit from each other's work. And, and so today I, I want to introduce two, I at least propose two phenomenological models that will enable us to access the unknown lens and the unknown pixel optics. And the first one is the ray transfer function, which will model the unknown lens. The second one is the pixel ray distributor, which will model the unknown micro uh, pixel optics. And I'll first talk about the RTF, the ray transfer function, and then I'll come back to the micro optics. So, yeah, so our task is to model an unknown lens. And Anyone of you probably who has done some image simulation in the past has already, did, already had to deal with this kind of problem before because for the past, we mostly did 2D simulation with 2D scenes. And for that, we always use point spread functions, which is another phenomenological model, right? And with the point spread function, you convolute it with an ideal image, which introduces the blurring and produces your final camera image. And that's how we used to model how a camera behaves. And you can ask the manufacturer, please produce me, please give me the point spread function, or you can make a setup to measure it yourself. And the caveat is a bit, well, you need one for each wavelength you're interested in. You need one for each distance of the object you're interested in, because it changes with the distance and with the field height, depending on where in front of the camera it is, the point spread function in general also changes. But it's all manageable as long as you stay in 2D scenes. And that's very limiting because 2D is really not 3D. Okay, for example, here I have this scene of a chess set, and this was a simulation with a 
a certain lens, double gauss lens, if you really want to know. And you see that some objects, they are in focus, nice and sharp. Some of objects are at different positions and therefore they are blurry. They're not in focus. And that's something you don't get in 2D. And specifically at the edges of objects, some other interesting uh, things happen when objects occlude each other. If you just look at this one object here, then some light rays come out and they are focused. If then a second object is introduced that occludes part of this object, then not the same set of rays reaches the image sensor and hence the point spread function will also be different. And so it's not trivial at all to really determine what to do with the point spread function and convolution near these edges. And it follows naturally from geometrical optic calculations in PBRT. And finally, well, it's a whole 3D world and you can have interreflections on all the walls and have illuminance on different sides. And that's really just inherently 3D and we, need, we can't do that with 2D uh, really. So, okay, let's go to the 3D world, which means that we need the lens design. And if you give me the lens design, the surfaces, the materials, then I can just enter that in PBRT and tra race, trace rays through them. Um, however, we don't have it. But in the end, we are, we're actually only interested in whether if we shoot a ray over here, where does it come out? That's the only thing we actually care about. I don't need to know the lens design. You just need to know something called the ray transfer function, uh, which is just an equivalent representation of the lens. And it will be some mathematical function that you find that maps input to output. Then, of course, maybe I just moved the problem. Now, of course, we need to find this mathematical function. And I'll, this has been our work, and I'll just tell you how, how, how we, we found one. And the clue lies really in the fact that nowadays, if you're friendly to your, uh, to your partners, often the manufacturers, they like to share with you something called the ZMAX black box model. It's a piece of software that you can load well in, in ZMAX and you can trace as many rays as you want through this black box and a ray comes in and a ray comes out and you can analyze the optical system but you don't know what happens inside. But just having this means that we have access to a big data set. We can generate lots of input rays. We can generate lots of output rays and then just try to find a mathematical function that maps input to output. And it's, and this has been uh, part of the publication uh, outlined here. And if you want to achieve this, you can just take, it's not rocket science. You really just take the standard, for example, MATLAB polynomial fitting toolbox, and you take the, the rays on the input, you parameterize them by position x, y, z, and their direction vector x, y, z. And you use that as an input for your polynomials or neural networks if you, if you want to. People have done that, also works. But we've tried polynomials, and that seems to work pretty well, actually. And then you predict the output parameters of the, the outgoing rays. And that's, 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 all there, that's almost all there is to it, because there's one little caveat. If you fit a polynomial, then you can evaluate it anywhere, right? If you have x squared, you can evaluate it from minus infinity to plus infinity. And that's not really what happens in a real, real lens, right? Some rays do not pass don't even reach the lens. Some rays reach the lens but never come out. And only a few rays actually re come through the lens and contribute to the signal. And so there's a small modification. If, if you're planning to implement such a thing, we have published this open source, but if you want to make your own version of this, just make sure that you have here something called that checks whether a ray should come out before you evaluate the polynomial. That's just a practicality and the details uh, are outlined in our uh, publication. But yeah, if we then implement all this in PBRT, we can, we can validate it, right? So I take a known lens design. In this case, it was a double Gauss lens. And I simulate this chess set scene. And I do the same thing for a fitted ray transfer function, which is supposed to be fully equivalent. And we get an identical looking scene. Right? We have objects out of focus in the same way. And we have the image circle that is correctly predicted and the, and the, the vignetting, which means like the, the shading over here. And if we look at this one horizontal line and we compare the lines, then we see that they're basically on top of each other, which means we, we've, we've, we've done the same thing, right? So that's good. But that was software validation, verification, if you like. But I was promising you an experimental validation. And that's what, in a recent project and led by Zhong Liu, my colleague, 
what we've done. We've, we've tried to experimentally validate this whole pipeline. And so Zhang and his colleagues, they, they set out to build something called a Cornell box. This is this little box here. It, it's a 3D box which has colored walls and an illuminant and light can bounce around. So there, there's inter-reflections and they have some 3D objects with shadows. And so it's a real inherently 3D scene that is well known to the computer graphics community. And we took the Pixel 4a phone and we measured, and this is what the scene then looks like, a measure, the raw image looks like. And then uh, Zhang made a 3D computer model of, of this Cornell box where we have all the walls and all the objects in there and used the ray transfer function of the Pixel 4a phone, which we could fit based on data provided by our friends at Google. And we trace the rays through the ray transfer function, put it in the ISAT cam, and then we get the final image, which is extremely similar to the actual measured image. And in the publication, we set out to really uh, elaborately validate the, the, whole, the whole simulation, the sensor, the noise, and everything. And this is just, I'm not gonna go deep into this one, but just how do you validate a camera? Well, or calibrate one. You take some test charts like, like, the, like this one, and you put it at different positions, and you see whether the measurement matches the prediction. And yeah, why would we move it? Because well, here there's more red light reflected, here there's more uh, green light reflected, and we wanted to see whether that was reflected in the measurements and the answer was there, yes. But here I just want to focus on how we tested the optical part because I'm talking about the ray transfer function. And so most of you will probably be familiar with how to calibrate such camera. You take a test chart like this, slanted bar, and you put it at different positions in front of the camera. And you look at how this line here gets blurred. If, this is a step function, eh? this is high, black is low. And you see how this line gets, gets blurred. This is called the line spread function. And this is what we measured. And then we did, we did that in the real box and we did that in simulation, putting them at the same position. And then we compare the, the simulation in blue, sorry, measurement is blue and simulation in red. And we, we, we got a very good match there. And so that really experimentally validated the whole, the whole pipeline. And in the paper, you'll find more validation about the noise validation and, and, and everything related. But I just want to conclude the ray transfer function because it's really a hooray for a phenomenological model because it will help vendors respect their, uh, help us to respect the vendor's uh, proprietary information. And it will enable us, the users, to really soft prototype and generate synthetic data to train our algorithms without having to make the actual system or at least uh, as soon as possible and so <laughs> yes that previous data slide were those um data totally fit by you or did that use the vendor provided cmax black box so so what we did is we we, we the vendor provided zmax black, black box model we ran a macro in zmax to produce the data fit the polynomials, fit, implement these polynomials in PBRT, and then ray trace the scene. Is that okay? Um, it's okay. So I've, I've, I've solved the first part now. It's like, yes, please. So when you change the, uh, when you focus the lens, you have to uh, collect different data for each possible focal plane of the lens, and also the other variables your lens would have to collect data for every possible focal plane of the lens. Um, yeah, that will be the question. So I think the question was, if you have a variable lens where you can adjust the zoom setting, for example, do you have to re get, recapture, retrain the data? Right? Yes. So, well, if you have a lens that doesn't change, you need to do it only once. And then the, the, the specific position of the sensor doesn't matter because you're basically fitting a light field. But in the case that you outline where you, for example, change the zoom setting where the physical distance between the lenses might change or changing the size of the aperture, in principle, you should recalculate the, the ray transfer function because that would be different, yeah. Is that, 
It's a question. Do you account for things like optical cross talk and the second effect circles and the gradient line spread function in the model? So, whether I account for optical cross talk and? And, uh, and electrical cross talk. Electrical cross talk. Oh. Electrical crosstalk could be included in ISET CAM. That's not something I'm going to address today, but it's it's in principle uh, uh, done at the ISET CAM level. But uh, um, optical crosstalk, well, one way would be like in the point spread function, if you measure it in, in a system, you would include that somehow. But um, I'm not explicitly modeling crosstalk here. No. Uh, the, the spread function to be a little degraded in, in the camera, real camera, compared to your modeling. Right. It's not being accounted for. It's not going to show up in right. But yeah, I agree. But for now, this will be your best first guess of, at the simulation, and then you can evaluate how uh, well we do. Um, okay. So onwards to the pixel optics, um, because they were just trying to simulate a smartphone, and nowadays we find all these micro lenses on the smartphone with multiple pixels. And for that, I would like to propose like something called pixel ray distributor that really helps us model that. And before I jump into that, uh, well, what, maybe I should explain why we have these interesting uh, pixel optics going on. And it all has to do with uh, autofocus. So we all have our smartphone nowadays where we can just point, click, and it magically focuses the light. Uh, sorry, focuses your image onto, onto the object you're of interest. And the technology that really enables that is something called PD pixel, dual pixel, quad pixel, it's, it's an evolving name, um, but basically what it means is we have a micro lens and below a micro lens, we have multiple pixels. In the case of a dual pixel, we have two pixels. In the case of quad pixel, we have one, two, three, four pixels. And what it does is like, depending on how the light arrives on this micro lens, different amounts of light arrive on the different pixels below the micro lens. And the differences in signal are somehow used, and I'll explain how, to determine whether something is in focus or not. And so if we really want to simulate that and use generate simulations that you can use for training your autofocus algorithms, we want to know the output of each pixel. And that means that we need to know how this micro lens distributes light between the different pixels. And so here we go. So here's a simple illustration of why this principle works. So let's start here on the top where we have a point source. We just radiate light towards the main lens here in blue. And this focuses light down. This, this time it's in focus. It nicely focuses down onto one micro lens in this case. Just simple geometrical model. And what you see in this case, well, here is an array of micro lenses. These are all micro lenses. And below each micro lens, we have two pixels, left and right, here in gray and black. And this case is in focus. And we see that. There's an equal distribution of light between the left and the right subpixel. And if we would just take all the gray pixels and put them next to each other, we have one image. And we take all the pixels on the right, the black ones, then we have another image. And I, here I show them on top of each other. And in this case, the image of the left pixels matches very well with the image of the right pixels. This is a simplification, but that's the general ID. But now if you put the object out of focus, I put it a bit further here on top, then well, light is now in focus here, and it's blurry over here. It's spread out over multiple micro lenses. And if you really look at now the, the different sub-images, then we see that only over here, only the left pixels receive light. And on the other side, only the red pixels, uh, the black pixels receive light. And basically what you have, that, that means is you have your left image and your right image, and when you're in focus, they're identical on top of each other. When something is out of focus, like here, you have a copy of the image, but almost a copy, but at different positions. There's a physical distance between the images. And so autofocusing means matching these two images on top of each other. So you can use image processing to define when something is in focus. That's the general idea of, of how autofocus works. And then, Let's say, okay, let's, let's simulate this. Uh, can we do this in PBRT? That's the question. And the suggestion would be like, can we just add these micro lenses to PBRT and, and be done with it? And the answer is not, well, in principle, yes, but not really in practice because PBRT is really the realm of geometrical optics. 
and it implements that rigorously and, and, and fantastically. But the pixels nowadays that we have and the micro lenses correspondingly, they are nowadays so small that diffraction becomes really important. Wave optics is important. Eh? For example, the smallest pixel here that I've been able to find uh, this year was, um, this is a pixel below a micro lens, 0.56 microns, so 560 nanometers. And you have to realize that the wavelengths we use is from 400 to, let's say, 700 nanometers. And diffraction becomes important at the scale of the wavelength. So we're there. So we need to, we need to care about this. And to understand the pixel optics, people use different tools. They don't use PBRT. They use numerical FTTD simulations or scalar wave optics, if you like, although that's debatable. And so you, you need to somehow connect these two worlds if you really want to simulate this correctly. And I'll show you why it's actually not that trivial and why you really should care about diffraction. Um, but let me start with the simple case, no diffraction. Here, I, this is just a simple scalar wave optics simulation. It's not a real pixel. It's just an illustration of what happens with the lens when it gets smaller. And it's a simple model of a pixel. So here, I illuminate a little micro lens with some light, some plane wave at different angles. And that's why this animation moves. It's just plane waves arriving at different angles. And you see that, yeah, well, when the micro lens is large enough, we get a nice cone from like in geometrical optics. And either all the light is on the right pixel or on the left pixel. And if we would plot the amount of light arriving on the left pixel or the right pixel as a function of the angle, we get the pixel ray distributor. We get these curves. Why is it called the pixel ray distributor? Well, first of all, we're doing something with a pixel. Second, we're in the, in the end interested how this light ray here with the corresponding plane wave is distributed between the left and the right subpixel. So in this case, we really um, have a very well-defined spot, right? So over, for this angle, for example, all the light is on the left pixel. And for the other one, all the right all the light is on the right pixel. And there is a little fast transition zone when the spot crosses towards the other pixel, conceptually. But if we add diffraction, right, the lens gets smaller and smaller, the, the light will spread out more. This is just a trend. And that means that it's well less well-defined where the spot will be. Some of the light will, there's some distribution of light across the, the subpixels. And so the curves you get are quite different where the slope of this gets flatter and flatter, which means the difference between the two gets smaller and smaller. They get closer and closer to each other. And well, that really, that means that, and that's sort of how you should read it, right? So at a certain angle, for example, at 10 degrees, the light arrives. Some of the light re still reaches the, this pixel and some of the light reaches that pixel. And that means in this, if you remember the ray diagram where we have the uh, two images, the left and the right image, and they should match, and when it's out of focus, they don't match. Well, if the two start to blend over in each other, then it becomes more and more difficult to know when there is a difference and to do autofocus. So that's, that's why, why this is a problem. And I'll show you some animations of that later. And so, well, this, this yes, please. The animation on the left that showed the lo side lobes yeah. made me think that you should see some ripples in the one on the right. But um... Oh, you take the... The integral and there, there actually are some ripples they're not very visible and also something to that is not included here is the fact that this beam goes beyond and so you'd have some crosstalk there but this is just a very simple rudimentary model it's not an actual pixel it's just illustrative for diffraction um, and so well we, we were looking for our phenomenological model and how to link the ray optics world of pbrt with the wave optics world of the pixel and well, we might have found it. This, this pixel ray distributor tells you how a ray and the corresponding local plane wave, because it's a small pixel, how the energy is distributed between the left and the right pixel, or however many pixels you put below your micro lens. It's, it's quite gen generalizable. And this, this is not per se a new idea. Other people have implemented and explored this idea before of how to distribute energy between subpixels. And so we, we also want to just validate. It hasn't been validated yet, and that's what we intend uh, to do. Now, if these curves would be shared already by manufacturers, my talk might be almost, well, would be complete by now. 
because then I could just implement this in my simulator, use these rays and distribute the energy accordingly. But for now, we don't have these curves yet. And I have to measure them with, uh, together with Andre <laughs> uh, ourselves. And uh, it's actually a pretty simple experiment. And that's, that's, that's also hopeful, right? You want a model that is easily obtainable. And so what we do is we put the image sensor on a rotation stage where we then check for collimated light at different angles, how the pixels respond. And so, for example, for a pixel in the center, you would, for example, obtain some curves. And for another pixel more near the side, you might get some different curves where you see that the curves would be offset because this is just a doodle, of course, but that the micro lens is not necessarily in the center to correct for the chief ray angle. And so you get for each pixel on the sensor, you can measure these curves, these pixel ray distributors and use them in your simulation. And well, this is, we haven't done the measurements yet. We're building the setup now. And this is just a little uh, uh, funny animation where we put on a rotation stage, the gimbal stage that can rotate the sensor in 3D. And we will, here's the image sensor and it will be illuminated by collimated light and we'll check how each pixel produces data. We haven't done that yet. However, I've shown you some of the pixel ray distributor curves. And so I can already show what a simulation might look like once we have the data you know, in, soon enough. And again, we're doing physically based simulation. And so I'll just guide you through the pipeline again, just as I outlined before. We start with a scene. If, for example, in this case, I took a chess set scene in 3D. So the pieces are at different positions in front of the camera and some ray is traced in PBRT through a lens, the ray transfer function. We don't know the lens, we use the ray transfer function. And then the ray arrives on the image sensor. And what we, do, we know two things of the ray. First, we know the irradiance associated with it, the energy. And second, we know the angle at which it arrives on the image sensor. And so the, the next step, what we do is we use our pixel ray distributor and we check the angle we go to our graph and we check here like, oh, for example, it's minus 10 degrees. Okay, then the energy of this ray should go 10% to the left pixel and 90% to the other pixel. And then we produce our images. And then and this is just a little animation and I'll explain what it means. But this animation then shows, alternates between the left and right images. And just as you would expect, there's some movement going on if things are blurry. And I'll just zoom in on that picture uh, in the next slide here. And so here we have this piece, this chess piece in the back, which by construction, I put in focus. And just as we, if you remember from the diagram, if something is in focus, then the left and the right subimages are on top of each other and there is no movement while the other piece does move. Now, if I change the focus from this piece to this piece, autofocus takes a while, okay. And then, then now this one is out of focus, it's blurry. And just as we expect from the diagram, if something is blurry, we get a difference between left and right images. And that's, that's sort of exactly what we see. And the other the piece in front now doesn't move uh, anymore. And so this already kind of shows you the potential of how one might now use these kind of images to train algorithms for all sorts of purposes like depth estimation or autofocus. And this goes beyond what you could do with 2D images. And just as a final animation, this is the same this is the same as on the previous slide, but it has actually, I used curves here, these pixel ray distributors where there's almost no diffraction. So it's almost this step function, perfect distribution. And so this exaggerates a bit the movement, but I just want to make the point that if we add diffraction and we use these curves that are more smooth and there's less difference between left and right, that's indeed what we get. If I add diffraction to it, then you see that yeah, it, it still does move on the right. It's like just very, not much anymore. Why? Because the two images you see on the left, they are just blend over more in each other. And the, visually we, we see less movement. And so that's really the promise of bringing ray optics with uh, wave optics together and make sure that you have synthetic data soon enough. And so again, it's a hooray for phenomenological models because again, vendors that make image sensors they can now think about whether they want to share this kind of data with us, which will protect their information because if they would sell a sensor to us, we could measure it ourselves. So we, there's a way forward for us already. 
and we can start doing soft prototyping and synthetic data generation. And so yeah, in conclusion, I, I'll just summarize what I think are some of the main points, which is that camera simulation really enables you to do soft prototyping and synthetic data generation, which has, has many applications. If you want to model the lens design and you don't know it, you can use ray transfer functions. And finally, if you want to model the pixel optics, make sure you think about the fact that diffraction is important and make the connection uh, appropriately. For example, using the pixel ray distributor. And so finally, I want to really thank the industrial collaborators that I have worked with for the past two years, especially uh, well, Ricardo for two years and especially Andre, thank you very much for intensive work for the past year. <laughs> Um, and, especially, and also Gordon Wan and uh, James uh, from Google who worked with me on the ray transfer function the first year. That was a lot of fun and I highly appreciate all the efforts. And so, well, I felt like maybe I should conclude with this slide again because I feel like, well, I made some contribution to making this guy look less sad, although we can't see his face. It seems like a sad scene. If we can just replace fog and rain with simulations, then we can maybe move forward. <laughs> So thank you very much. Um, we're gonna we have some questions online, but we're gonna handle the questions from the audience first. So um, feel free, and, and then maybe for the recording, if you I'll repeat the question. question. Yeah. Yes, please. Micro lens one pixel, or if you have four pixels, does that increase ah. the spatial resolution? Well, there seems to be some <laughs> flux about what is nowadays a pixel, but in this case, what I showed you is we have a micro lens, and below that we have multiple photo sites, photo diodes, and whether you want to call the whole a pixel or the things below a micro lens a pixel, that's a bit debatable at this point, I would say, but. Like in the final image, do you count those or no? Right, well, in the final image, you, well, they act as your pixels, right? These subpixels. You take only the left pixels and that's your image, and you take only the right pixels and that's another image. And so they act as pixels. In yeah, you don't the they're, they're, they're some. Oh, okay, so they are get somewhere. Else. Oh yeah, so yeah, yeah, that's true. Or instead of two, what's the advantage there? Well, so two would give you only like a. Oh yeah, so the so yeah, good. So the question is why there are two uh, four pixels or two pixels below a micro lens, and what's the advantage? Well, two pixels would give you a, a difference in in one dimension, and if there is if it's uh, uniform in that direction, you would not be able to have information. So if you have all two dimensions, you can focus uh, more robustly. That's the idea. It's a small comment. I mean, uh, historically, like uh, 2015, we had like this, like a uh, dual sub pixels under a single micron, typically. IMX uh, 362, IMX 363, etc. Later, we had this like, kind of tendency having several independent pixels with totally independent without, uh, without under a single micro lens, up to nine pixels, like a nano cells, so maybe like under a single pixel. So, yeah, it's uh, both are like valid, both exist, and both are like uh, introduction. Yeah, Andrew, just that's a quick question. Uh, how did you deal with the, the optical crosstalk? And that's the like main question. And for optical crosstalk, because of the overlap of the QEs of the uh, ages and pixels, your initial 3D model was that a multispectral model, or was that like multispectral space, or like in like lower space, lower like dimension, like RGB, right. 3D space? So I'll repeat the question. So there are two questions. One is how did I handle optical crosstalk, and second, whether the simulations were fully spectral? The answer to the second question is yes. So this PBRT, well, you can put as many wavelengths as you want. And in general, we use 31 wavelengths to, uh, to, to have an actual spectrum and everywhere. So about your first question, optical crosstalk, I didn't include that explicitly in here at this moment. But well, one can say like there are multiple contributions of optical crosstalk. First of all, you have the main lens, which can cause diffraction. And so you could consider that a form of optical crosstalk. In PBRT, that is not included, although people have recently worked on adding ray-based diffraction techniques to PBRT. So we might get there. 
And the second is optical crosstalk might occur in the pixel itself, like reaching the neighboring pixel. Um, this is not, I didn't include that myself, but I'm very curious about how this will show up in these angular sensitivity curves, because, well, if crosstalk occurs, you will see it in angular sensitivity curves. And when you use them in the simulator, you will somehow incorporate that effect, although the light is not really coming from the neighboring pixel. So I'm, I'm curious what will happen there. And that's something good to check. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. On the second question, mm -hmm. uh, is that like an angle of sensitivity curves that like vendors provide to us show that we don't have like a zero sensitivity on like this, like a minus 50 plus 15 degrees. We have some like pedestal, like 20% that actually refers to this uh, optical crosstalk. So yeah, you're right, but uh, that like the measurements just show that we have it and we can directly use it in simulations. Or can it come from the, the lens flare maybe? Uh, I, from lens for a flare definitely, but it's also just like the optical cross talk uh, on the level of pixel optics. So it's multiple sources. Uh, I was curious about the directional uh, Measuring the depth, as you mentioned, this can help for that estimation application. Mm -hmm. I was curious if you can elaborate more, like uh, you're gonna use the disparity or how, how do you measure oh. that? So, well, oh yes. Good. So the question is how one might do depth estimation from these kind of measurements. Well, the way I understand it, I haven't done much work on that per se, but is, well, if, if you assume that like at a certain position of the sensor, there's a certain plane that is in focus. It's not, it's, it's a slice in 3D. Then you have some idea of where that object may be. And that would be one way forward. Just knowing that for this lens, if you put the sensor that far, then approximately that distance is in focus. If you know that, then you might get some destiny animation. And that would be, I, that's at least for me, the, the physical reasoning behind it. How you make that work with some advanced algorithms, that's, that's beyond me at this point, but yeah. But you may know much more about that. <laughs> this sounds, uh, is this like a micro stereo like that you get from this like a PD, uh, dual PD pixel disparity? It's widely used in industry like to produce some depth maps. Uh, pixel three, pixel four, all like a portraiture mode are using this like uh, uh, PD disparity based models to provide this like a uh, face isolation and making this like artificial blue. For the portraits, so it's yeah, it's it's possible, and there are some like uh, third party applications that provide you depth map uh, from the phones, like uh, cameras with dolphin pixels, because uh, they have just like all the So, yeah, um, so I'd like to um ask some of the questions from that were typed into the chat window. We've been having a very interesting discussion here, and I'm sorry the people on the online haven't been able to hear that, but. I'm going to first uh, ask questions that were um, typed into the chat window, and then um, then we have somebody, Tolga, who's going to ask a question, and I'll unmute him. Um, so first from Anton, uh, do the synthetic images come with depth information? And I guess they're referring to the... Right. Yeah. So I don't have to repeat the question now, right? You don't have to repeat the question now. <laughs> uh, so, well, PBRT, just like it gives you for free the segmentation, it will give you any information you want, the depth map, PBRT can just produce that for you. So you have that information. Right. And uh, Michael McDonald's asking, uh, interested in understanding how a system trained on synthetic data performs on real data. Often the simulations have appeared cartoonish, uh, example, more consistent texture on roads and found in real life. And I wonder how well they hold up in real life scenarios. Sounds like a great idea for a new paper. <laughs> <laughs> um, also, uh, Jenny has done some work on yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And oh. uh, another. Uh, okay, some from uh, Tolga. Uh, yeah, you, you'll be able to ask your question online. Just a minute. Um, uh, Ping Fang, um, are you trying to get the Zernike polynomials Hello? of the lens in order to specify the lens? If the polynomials aren't Zernike, what kinds of polynomials are you looking for and how many parameters and coefficients? Right. Well, I, I, can, I can say something about that. So the question is about whether you Zernik polynomials are often used to model the wavefront, for example, in the exit pupil. But I'm sure there's some relationship to the polynomial we fit, although we are in the geometrical uh, realm and Zernik polynomials are in the wave optics realm. There's a connection. But a specific Zernik polynomial will be for a specific field. And so 
you would have to do something beyond that to account for all possible incidence angles of the light, which will change the, the field. So that's um, in terms of number of coefficients. Well, it really depends on the lens. For some lenses, we got away with a sixth order polynomial. For some lenses, we really need to push it to 10, even one plus 15. And so that's a limiting factor, actually. And but people are doing some work on like making sparse fittings and neural networks to make to optimize that. In the end, it's just about finding the right function. No, it doesn't, doesn't need to be a polynomial. Uh, there's a question about um, autofocusing on zoom lenses. I think you already answered that question, so I'm just going to skip that one. Um, having sure. to do it. Okay, well, when you use an autofocusing or zoom lens, do we need to fit the ray transfer function by poly polynomial as many times? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, and uh, what about micro lens shift radially? Yes. Right. You're modeling. Well, so so I, I I presume that this is a question about the fact that you have your pixels and depending on which pixel, the micro lens manufacturers, they put the micro lens at different positions. They don't center necessarily the pixel, the micro lens on the pixel. And the reason they do that is to correct for the chief ray angle. Because if there's, if, if the lens is here and light arrives at an angle, then you will always have light arriving on one pixel rather than the two pixels. And so, and you offset the micro lens so that the focus spot is again, centered between the left and the right sub pixel. So in that in that sense, yes, it's included. Well, because it's a phenomenological model, we'll measure it and it, we'll just measure what, whatever it does. That's the idea. Yeah. Um, so Ramin has a question. How would you use the pixel um, PRD, uh, pixel ray distributor, um, if there are no multiple pixels under a micro lens? Well, I'm not sure we would really needed them, right? If there's one pixel below a micro lens, then, then we can just proceed as we've done it in the past and just know how much light arrives on, on a pixel. Yes, please. Uh, this question has a totally great practical sense. There is like a big problem on fitting the lens with sensor with like a different, like a, a chip ray angle, like, uh, like sensitivity, chip ray angle response. And uh, having this like angular response just allows us to experiment, experimentally uh, define this like uh, chip ray angle response and get the perfect fit with specific lens. Yeah. So so let me add just something to that. It's there are nowadays. Well, first of all, some things like pixel vignetting couldn't be included in this kind of uh, calculations. But also there are newer structures being developed. Right. There you have we have color routers nowadays. Uh, we have uh, meta lenses. And so all these kind of new structures, which rely on wave optics to work, they might be included in some kind of similar framework. And so even when it's only one pixel in the end, uh, that might be useful to, yes. Just to support what you're saying, and also Andre, um, in the paper that Joan published, we, everything was fit quite well, except for the lens shading. Yes, that's right. And that was because we were a little uncertain about the um, offsets of the mic, we thought yeah. uh, the offsets of the micro lens. And so that was really Andre's point and your point also that let, if there's only one pixel, then it's just about lens shading and the role of the micro lens in the lens. Okay, we have um, some more questions, but I think Tolga has been so patient, I'm going to unmute you uh, so you can ask a question. Hi, can you hear me? I think we should be able to hear you. I okay. Hear you. Uh, two questions, really. I was wondering, one is that for transfer functions, uh, would it be a possible, uh, would it be a realistic scenario where someone can, you know, inverse reverse engineer and like, because like the real subset of possible configurations for a system is limited. And then can someone use like a machine learning approach to reverse engineer that? And the second is, how do you think the, uh, the autofocusing methods or the methods that you described in general would help the, you know, physics driven ML for like things like super resolution or, or autofocusing images um, in combination with uh, ML approaches. You have to repeat it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'll do the second question first. The question is about how these kind of simulations might help for super resolution techniques. And I, I, I don't have that much to say about that, except for, well, in this kind of, just, just my, just thinking now out loud, you can make whatever resolution you want in this kind of simulators. 
And so maybe you can use that as ground truth with synthetic data so you can test your algorithms on lower resolution and see how well it matches the higher resolution in PBRT. That's, uh, that's one. So someone has to add, someone in the audience wants to add something to that. The simulations allow you to like uh, simulate any kind of sub pixel uh, shifted images that they kind of can jitters that allow you to like make this like a uh, multi frame super resolution things. Yeah, right. Just I'll repeat it. Just yeah, repeat. Andre suggests that it's also useful to incorporate hand jitter of the camera and, and motion artifacts. Yeah, so that might be. So I think it's already being used, even right? This kind of things. Yeah. Did you answer? I'm sorry, can, can you repeat the first question you had? Because I uh, that is, I think you mentioned that without giving the specifications of the hardware, the manufacturer, someone can provide you with the transfer function and you could work with that. But I'm thinking for realistic systems, like uh, hardware configuration is rather a subset of all possibilities and one can conveniently kind of like have an inverse problem and kind of figure that out, the hardware. Do you think that's a possibility or... So, so the, is the question whether we can, based on like this data and this RTF, et cetera, whether we can reverse engineer the system and have the actual components? Yeah, to some extent. That's hopeful, but I, I, I wouldn't hope, I wouldn't bet on it. <laughs> I, I don't think it will. Really problem. I, I, yeah. <laughs> um, and I also see no real need for this uh, if we can get away with the phenomenological model. Um, but it's an interesting uh, question to address, though. Um, because, well, this, this kind of lens, they're becoming way more sophisticated and they're not all uh, spherical anymore. And you have aspherics, you have freeform lenses soon enough. And so you need some starting point to solve your inverse problem. And maybe if you know it's a double Gauss, you can do it. But if you just don't know anything, maybe it's getting quite hard. Okay, um, a few more questions. Um, Christos is asking, would the transfer function work for wide field of view lenses where the entrance pupil is not planar? Right. Well, I, I already feel bad about throwing a picture now. Um, but the, in, the, in the paper, we outline this specific case actually where the so the so the question is basically the exit pupil of the lens. If you look at it from different points of view, it will actually appear to change shape or actually seem to move around a bit depending on what kind of lens you use. And you need to somehow model that. And in the paper, we outline a method of how to do that. And just as a summary, we, what we do is we, for each field position we're interested in, we shoot a bundle of rays towards the lens and we look at the subset of rays that pass through, right? And then we take a slice on a plane and then we have some convex shape, whatever the shape may be. And we have a convex shape for each field position. And then we find some function to interpolate between that. And that's your effect. We, we call it the ray pass function and it's, something that decides before you use the polynomial whether the ray will come out or not. And it takes fully into account that the exit pupil can do all sorts of crazy, crazy things. Yeah. Okay, question from Amir. To measure and model the focus, we may use Moray pattern. What is the advantage or disadvantage of the approach described in the presentation versus getting low pass filter model from a Moray pattern? I'm not sure I fully understand the question, actually. Yeah. Well, well, you know what? I, I think it's kind of related to the previous question, and I think it's more of you have to it's kind of uh, explain how you're, uh, how this is different. Uh, the Another person asked, uh, point spread function already takes into account the diffraction in the physical simulation. Right. Can you first use geometric ray tracing to get images and then compile the image with the point spread function to get the diffraction limited range? So I think both of them are, right. yeah. Well, well, I think it's an opportunity for you to explain how. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, so I explained at some point that uh, if you have 2D scenes, you are perfectly fine using point spread functions. They include the, the geometrical part. They include the diffraction part, just as uh, it's been suggested. And all, all, all of that is there. But if you want to go to 3D, then using a point spread function becomes non-trivial. Maybe they'll, Maybe someone will find a way to do it properly, but... For now, the ray tracing seems the only real way forward. What am I, so but it also implies that the lens simulation does not include diffraction. Two things about that. One is that most of the time, if you're away from the, the perfect focus, then geometrical optics will dominate again. So for most part of the image, you might actually be fine. Second uh, comment is that, well, there is actually maybe some opportunity to combine the two. 
where most of the part of the scene will be modeled by PBRT. And then you use some convoluting kernel, which is some something that people do like Genie for adding lens flare. And you can add some diffraction effects like that. It might not be perfect. It might be good enough for your kind of application. You have something to explore. And I think Ryan. Yeah, yeah, algorithm for yeah. randomizing. Right. Um, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Um, I think at this point, um, we're going to have a lot of really interesting discussions going on and we have some snacks and food for people who are here so let's continue this and um, i want to thank thomas very much for this talk and for those of you who are online uh, i know thomas loves to talk to people so feel free to <laughs> contact him if you want to continue if you have any more questions so thank you very much for joining i'm going to stop recording <laughs>